Ta-da! Okay. Ha! I've never given a presentation before. This is my first time, uh, and uh, so obviously I need help. All right. Hi, everybody. How are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. All right. All right. Yeah, very good. I appreciate it. Hey, can we get a selfie? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a photo. You smile. Say open source. Pretend like you're happy. And we'll get on with it, okay? It'll be fine. Okay. Ready, steady, open source. Uh oh. Yeah. Sweet nectar. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, everybody. My name is Josh Long. It is so good to be here with you today. Thanks for that photo. I'm going to take that photo. I'm going to show it to my daughter, and I will say, see, they listen to me. <laughs> but uh, yes, my name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Kotlin Google developer expert. I'm a Java champion and a Spring developer advocate. Uh, and I am most cringeworthy of all. A YouTuber. <sighs> anyway, uh, I'm online. How many of you are using uh, YouTube? Who uses YouTube? All right, find me on YouTube. It's fun. Uh, what about email? Email. Does anybody here use email? No. Okay, good. Moving on. And then there's, that, uh, there's the bird website as well. You can find me there. I'm so glad to be here with you all today. You know, this is not my first time in beautiful, beautiful Sofia or beautiful, beautiful Bulgaria. A uh, long time ago, many, many years ago, I came here and I met this guy. Well, this is, so this is 2011, right here, right? November 2011. And I met Jean-Claude Van Damme here in Bulgaria, right? See this? I don't know what this says. What does that say over there? <laughs> like, uh, uh, and, and by the way, look, I'm trying to teach him about spring and cloud, and he was really into it, right? He got it. He got it. But this guy was his bodyguard. Look at him. No neck, right? <laughs> no neck. He was ready. He was ready in case I tried to teach him about PHP code. He knew what that meant. So, you know. Yeah, anyway, just good to, good to be here. And I'm really excited because, you know, things get better all the time. All the time. Things are improving. I've been coming to this beautiful country for uh, 15 years, basically. Yeah, 15 years. And I, every time I come here, things are better. There's never been a better time to be a Java and Spring uh, developer. And I say this knowing full well where we are in the history of it. How many of you saw this? This is the history of Spring, right? Uh, Spring1.io, history of Spring. It's a video game. You can use your mouse arrow and kind of hit the boxes. Doop. Rod Johnson and Jurgen Holler start the open source project. Spring Framework 1.0 released in 2004. So that's right. This year, 2024, is 20 years since 1.0 GA Spring Framework. And then you go down here, Spring Security. Go down, get some spring data, got your uh, spring boot, you got your spring batch, you've got all the spring integration. Now we're up in the clouds. I hope this is not too subtle. We're in the clouds, right? So spring cloud 1.0 2015, spring cloud task 2016, spring cloud stream, spring cloud data flow. Uh, and then we're down here in the water. So uh, Kubernetes, maritime themes, navigation themes, right? Spring Cloud Dataflow for Kubernetes, Spring Cloud Skipper, and then this brings us to Spring Cloud Gateway for Kubernetes, and then, of course, the modern era, starting in 2022, where we have Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6, uh, which brings us to where we are today. And friends, things are getting better all the time, all the time, right? There's new stuff. And so today, my friends, we're going to kind of see how some of that works uh, in the Java ecosystem, what it looks like. Today And of course, to do that, we're going to go to my second favorite place on the internet. Who knows what my first favorite place is? Production. Thank you. This is my second favorite place. Second. My first is, of course, production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It is better than Disneyland. But if you have never been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io, okay? 
So, friends, we have some choices that we need to make. What build tool do you want to use, Gradle or Maven? What, Java, what language do you want to use, Java, Kotlin, or Groovy? And then, what do we want to name our service? And friends, I'm going to name my service, Service. Because I'm great with names. I'm amazing with names. I get this from my father. My father was amazing with names. When I was a small boy, we had a small white dog, and my father named him White Dog. <laughs> amazing with names. Amazing. I get that from him. Uh, that said, my mom, she tells me all the time, she says, you're very lucky that I named you. And uh, yes, that's probably true. Then, my friends, we have a question of what version of Java do you want to use? Friends, we have three versions here, but only two are appropriate. Only two, okay? You see this version over here, Java 17? You should never use this, ever, in any situation. It's completely unacceptable in polite company, and especially in production. Friends, Java 17 is technically inferior in every way. Put another way, Java 21 and later are technically superior in every way. They're better in every way. They're faster, more syntax rich, more robust, more secure, more uh, production worthy, and more scalable, a lot more scalable. They're also morally superior. You won't like the look of sadness and shame in your children's eyes when they see that you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do this. Be the change you want to see in the world. Use at least Java 21 or later, okay? Now, we have some dependencies we need to add. I'll add the GraalVM support, the web support, the Docker Compose support, the Postgres support, the Spring Data JDBC support, uh, the uh, DevTools support, right? The Spring Modulith support, the Postgres, oh, we already got that. This, it's 2024, so we'll add some AI support, open AI, for example. Uh, what else do we want? Web, Docker Compose, Postgres, DevTools, Modulith, OpenAI, GraalVM. Ah, it's probably enough. Let's hit generate, and that'll give us a zip file that I'm going to open up in my IDE. I'm using IntelliJ. Who uses IntelliJ? Just curious. I love it. That looks like a good, what is that, half the room, right, at least? Who's using uh, 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 the Eclipse? Okay, okay. What about uh, Visual Studio Code? Okay, I think there's slightly more than uh, Eclipse. What about Emacs? Okay, no, no takers. NeoVim? No, no. NetBeans? Anybody, there's two people. All right, good. All right, moving on. So we have a public static void main. This is going to be a data-centric application. And because it's going to be data-centric, I had Spring, the start, I had the Spring Initializer generate a Postgres Docker Compose file for me. And Spring Boot will automatically start this up for me if I want, but then it also stops it, and that can be a little annoying. So you could use a property, or you can just get rid of the Docker Compose support like that, okay? And, uh, and I need to do this anyway, so I'll do that. Then we need to configure our connectivity. So Spring Data Source URL JDBC colon Postgres QL localhost uh, my database, all right? And then we have to specify the username, right? Username equals uh, my user, and then the password equals secret. Don't tell anybody. We're gonna also have Spring Boot initialize the SQL database with some SQL files, right? So we've got, I think, uh, the basic configuration here. Let's go start up the application. Here we go, Docker Compose up. Is it running or is it already running? Uh, it might already be running. No, orphan, okay, good. Running, okay, attaching. So I wanted to do Docker Compose down and then up. I don't want it to like connect to an existing one. There you go, brand new database. Okay, and we're gonna have IntelliJ create a SQL connection here so we can kind of see what's going on in our database. Very good. Now, uh, friends, we're gonna build a data-centric application. This means we have data. So let's create some schema, huh? Let's create some schema here, schema.sql. I'll create a table. Uh, if not exists orders, okay, ID serial, primary key, and we'll create another table here, okay, create another table here called orders line items, and here, uh, what, are we, what, are, what are we gonna have? Well, we're gonna have the ID, it's gonna be a primary key, right? We're gonna have the product, which is an int, 
uh, not null, default. There you go. Okay. And then we're going to have the quantity, which will be not null and defaulting to zero. Okay. Very good. So there's our basic schema. It's oh, and, oh, and by the way, this is going to be orders. Okay. Uh, int foreign. Sorry, orders. Ref, um, int references. Orders. Okay. Uh, orders. ID. Okay. There we go. So there's my primary key, my foreign key to the other table. So it's a one-to-many relationship, orders and line items for each order. Okay, Good. Uh, we've got now our public static void main. I want to model that data. So I'm going to create a module in my code, Okay, a modular uh, 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 or, you know, um, CRM kind of thing. So I'll create a package here called orders. And in this, I'll create a orders controller. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm using Spring Modulith. How many of you have heard of Spring Modulith? Spring Modulith gives you the ability to modularize your code base, to design it in such a way that you have nice, well-encapsulated uh, modular functionality. This is very important because you can start as a small monolithic application, and if you need to, the code is already designed in such a way that you can then extract it out and become microservices later on. This is better for everybody. But it also, it helps us to break a really bad pattern. How many, and don't be ashamed, don't be shy, we all did it once in college, how many of you have code with a package, you know, controllers and then models and then services and then repositories? How many of you have packages that look like that? Okay, okay, now don't judge, don't judge. We've all done this, okay? But it's really bad because you think about why we do this. It requires you to make everything public. In Java, public is an extra keyword. It's not the default. There's a good reason for this, right? You're not supposed to make everything public. It violates the encapsulation that the language is trying to give you. And so what we want to do is flip the layering of our code sideways, 90 degrees. Instead of layering code by the role of the component in the system. We want to group things by the functionality in the system, okay? So here, I'm going to have a, mo uh, a package called orders, but this represents a bounded context. It's part of my aggregate. It's going to manage all things related to order. So we'll say at controller, at response body, and I'm going to describe some basic data here. I've got a record for an order, right? Integer ID, okay? like that. And I've got another here called line item. And this will have an ID. It's going to have an int product, an int quantity. Okay. And this will have a set of line items, right? Line items. There we go. Good. So this is the, the line item is part of the domain of the order. It's part of the aggregate of the order. The life cycle of the line item doesn't, you know, the, the line item does not exist unless you have the order. If you delete the order, you have to delete the line items, right? So they're part of the same aggregate. They're part of the same uh, life cycle, okay? So this is a Spring Data JDBC entity. So I can just create a table here called orders. Here's another one, orders line items. Okay, very good. Very good. So now I've got my basic uh, uh, syntax there. And notice what I'm doing. I'm using Java records. I love records. I love records so, so, so much. I love them so, so much. I love them. I just think about them all the time. Records are amazing. Records are amazing. And they're actually part of a series of things that the Java language team calls data-oriented programming. And this includes three or four different features, right? Sealed types, records, pattern matching, and uh, uh, smart switch expressions, okay? These things are together, they support this idea of data-oriented programming in Java 21 or later, right? So these are new, this is a new paradigm and a new way of thinking about building software. The Java language team introduced some of these features in earlier versions of Java, but they really come together, they finish, they become more complete in Java 21. The idea here is that in the old days, we would have these large code bases, and if you wanted to add a new dimension, if you wanted to express a change in the system, you would add a new subclass, a new specialization. You do uh, you know, polymorphism, right? 
you'd have specializations of deep hierarchies of types. But now, today, we're building smaller services, and usually those services have data that's being sent to and from the network, right? It's over the network from Kafka, from RabbitMQ, from gRPC, from RSocket, from REST, from GraphQL. The data is the way we express change in the system. And if data is so important, if messages are so important, then the language needs to make working with messages and data more elegant, okay? So that's what they did. Let's take an example, a very, very quick little example. Imagine I have a type, okay, digression, okay? Data-oriented programming, here we go. So imagine we have a type called alone, and I wanna make sure that we have validation around those kinds of loans in the system. You don't want to have different unknown implementations of this type because there are legal consequences. There are laws that attach to this type, right? If you work in a financial industry company, then you have to care about these scenarios. So let's say I have a loan and I'm going to seal this loan, okay? Uh, sealed interface loan. I'm going to permit two implementations, secured loan and unsecured loan, okay? Well, it's still unhappy. It's still saying, hey, you can't do this because these classes, first of all, they need to implement loan. But even if I do this, even if I do this, it's still unhappy. And the reason it's unhappy is because these are not sealed. They need to be either final or marked as sealed again. So I'll make them final, okay, like this. But the unsecured loan, you know, I can make this a record, right? I, I'm gonna make this a record and give it some state. So here we go. And these are implicitly final. Records are very powerful. Records have, uh, they are the equivalent of a tuple. Java records, more or less, sort of, equals tuples, right? In other languages, tuples are carriers for data without names attached to it, right? But Java is a nominal language. Our data types have names. So a record is a tuple, it's a carrier of data, and these are the components of that data, right? Uh, like string, you know, whatever, right? It's just uh, all these different components, com they are the identity of the record. The contract is very simple. This loan is equal to the identity of these fields. If you want to recreate the loan completely, all you need are these values, okay? And if you understand that contract, you understand that there's no derived state, then the Java language can do some amazing things for you. It can create constructors, it can create a two string and equals and hash code, it can create storage, it can create getter methods, all that for free just by using records. So I'm gonna create a record here to describe the unsecured loan and I've got a secured loan and I've got this hierarchy called loan. Now let's suppose I wanna create a message to display to the user based on the loan, right? So display message for loan, loan. Okay, now I need to describe the message that I'm gonna send back. So I'll say message equals like this, and I'll say return message. All right, now I have some inspections to do. I can say if it's a secured loan, then SL equals secured loan, loan, good. Uh, and I can say uh, message equals secure, nice loan. Well done, right? Very, very nice message. What about over here? Loan instance of unsecured loan var usl equals unsecured loan and now i can say ouch you know very expensive uh, and then we can say that loan dot interest is going to hurt right very very hostile message so i'm sending back the message well can i clean this up a little bit well first of all yes of course i can use pattern matching the idea is that I have a pattern here that I'm matching with a language. If I match, I can extract, right? So I can do this. Now I don't need to provide that downcast variable. Same thing over here, right? USL. So this is pattern matching. I'm extracting, and then within the context of this block, this is, I can cast down to that. I can dereference things in the unsecured loan that don't exist in the base type. Okay, that's better, but I can go a step further. Did you know I can extract the components of the record itself? So var interest, and then I can just do this. Even better. Isn't that nice? So this is actually the float that I described there. Okay, so I'm pattern matching and I'm extracting, I'm destructuring the data. Okay, what else can I do? There's a problem here. First of all, if I don't 
implement this branch, what happens? Nothing happens. The compiler doesn't care. I want help. I want to make sure that for all the implementations of loan in my system, I'm handling every corner case, right? Very important. I want to make sure that everything is being uh, handled correctly. So I'm going to use smart switch expressions, right? So I'll say switch loan case unsecured loan. Okay. Uh, actually, I want to do this. I want to do var interest. And then I'll just take this here. Okay. Very nice. And then what about the loan? Okay, well, if, if it's loan, okay, case, secured loan, SL, and then I can return this. So now I've got two branches in my switch expression, and I'm assigning the results to the message variable, so it actually takes up less code, right? Uh, oops, secured loan, here we go. There you go. So I've got two different branches. It's taking up less code. I can, in fact, I can just ret return that. And very importantly, watch this. If I comment out this case, oops, wrong one. If I comment out this case, the IDE and the compiler say, hey, you don't cover all the possible input values. It's making sure that I've handled both cases, both branches, because it knows that the sealed types are exhaustive. It knows about all the possible cases there. So the compiler is helping me make sure that I cover all cases. It knows what types I have in the system. This way, Somebody cannot come along and create an anonymous inner class loan that has no op checks for the validation, right? I don't want to get in trouble with the law by switching or avoiding uh, uh, the, the rules and regulations and safety for my loan. Okay, so this is data-oriented programming. It's just a really interesting thing. Uh, we're not going to use it all that, but I just want you to know, when you see me using records, remember, this is just the beginning. It's a whole new world, okay? So now, let's talk about my orders controller. I'm going to inject the orders repository. Did I create that down here? No, I didn't. We're going to create a repository. So order repository extends list of CRUD repository. Order integer. OK. There's this. And I'll say order repository. Inject that into the constructor. And we're going to have an endpoint here that will take a post and we'll create a, uh, uh, an order. So create. And we'll say request body order order. Good. And we're going to save the order. So saved. Okay. Sa system out. Saved. Blah. Saved. Okay. Good. So there's this. Now, this is one method. I want another method to read the records as well. So I'll say collection of order orders. And I'll return this.findall. Very good. Pretty straightforward, yeah? Okay. So I think we have a very simple API. Let's go ahead and restart the application, or start it, actually. All this time, we haven't started it. <clears throat> okay, so now curl, well, first of all, HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash orders. Does that work? Uh, something is wrong. What did I do wrong? No static resources orders. Controller response body get mapping. Oh, I didn't put a route. Sorry, yeah. So I'm using dev tools. So with, when I have dev tools, I don't have to restart the whole program, right? I can just do compile, and it gives me that. So restarting much quicker if I just do build, basically, right? I'm just doing recompile, command shift F9 right there. OK, so now I go here, take two, and you can see there's nothing in the, in the endpoint right now. So post minus D, OK, uh, and H content type application JSON. Here we go. OK. So line items, OK? And then we have a single line item. Or uh, product is 42. And quantity is, of course, 2, right? There we go. So we post that. And now we can call git. And we can see we have the record. The data has been written to the, to the module, OK? Pretty straightforward. If you look at the database here, you can actually see this as well, right? Refresh. Here we go. Tables, orders, etc. There's the order, orders, line items. Pretty straightforward. OK, but now this is a module, but it's part of a larger system, isn't it? This system has other moving parts. So I want to update those other moving parts based on those changes. And this is where it becomes important to think about decoupling 
modules in your system. Spring Modulith makes this very easy. One way that it supports that, oh yeah, one way that it supports that is by using e event-driven decomposition, right? Spring has had support for this for decades. And this gets us to one of my favorite blogs by Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler has this great blog called, What Do You Mean by Event Driven? And he talks about the four different kinds of uses of event-driven decoupling, right? You've got event notifications, where the event actually is used to tell another system that something has changed. It doesn't give you the details of what has changed, it just gives you the fact of the change, okay? <clears throat> then we have event-carried state transfer. Event-carried state transfer shows up when you want to update the clients of another system uh, that something has changed and you want to tell them what has changed. You're communicating not just the fact of the change, but the delta as well. And then we have event sourcing. And event sourcing is very simple. Here, if you understand that your system is basically a series of messages and they are, uh, that, that have arrived in a certain order, then you can recreate the current state of the system by recreating the messages. And if you understand that, then you might as well store all of the messages. That way, you can replay them. This is good for auditability. It's also good for correcting algorithmic or systemic problems because you can fix the algorithm, replay the messages, and now the state is correct. And then finally, we have CQRS. And this is the, the realization, the insight, that the way you write data to a system might be different from the way you read from a system. So you might have a denormalized view of the data to support fast read operations that's different from the way you store the data, okay? So all these are supported by event, uh, sort of eventing. And Spring has an event uh, bus, if you will, and it's called, uh, the, it's called the Application Event Publisher. I'm gonna add that to the, con the, the, the constructor there, and now I'm gonna publish a message to other things in the module, in the system. I'm gonna create a new module here called Inventory, and I'm gonna call this inventory. And in this package here, I'm going to have a type, an, an event called inventory updated event. Okay. And I'll just make this a record. Sure. Uh, instant, instant, um, int product, int quantity. Okay. Pretty straightforward. That's an event that I'm going to use to decouple one part of the system from the other. Okay. So I, now I want to listen for that event. I could use Spring Framework's event listener, right, void uh, uh, inventory updated, right, uh, and I can use this listener, th this event here, and this would work just fine, I guess, so, you know, the inventory has been updated, need to reconfigure state, right, and that's uh, this data here, inventory, good, so I'll put that in there. Good. So I could do that if I wanted, uh, let's, but, but there's a couple problems. First of all, if I publish a, an event from the main thread, so let me, let me sleep for 10 seconds there, throws exception, okay? If I publish this event from the main thread, and then put that in the bottom there, uh, what happens? Well, let's go ahead and restart the program. Oh, I have to, what happened? It didn't see the code. Whatever, just restart, okay? So now if I go back to the command line, we're expecting, uh, actually, let's go to the controller here. So it's going to say saved, and now I need to publish the event. I say repository this.publisher.publish new inventory updated event, uh, and I'm going to say uh, saved.lineitems.foreach, right, uh, publisher.publish event, new inventory updated event, passing in instant.now, passing in uh, um, l. Uh, product and l dot quantity. Okay, so I'm going to publish this event for each line item, telling other things in the system about what has changed. Okay, so they can update their own view of the system state. Okay, there we go. Um, if I do that, and then I'm going to I'm going to say, okay, system out finished processing save. Right, or actually, let's just move this down here. That way, it's more clear. Good. So Command Shift F9 restart. Okay, so now I go here. And you can see it's taking 10 seconds to return, right? So I'm in one module, I published an event, but I'm waiting for that event to finish. That doesn't feel good. What if that other thing fails? There's no transaction either, right? 
And also, even if there was a transaction, I don't want to wait. Why should I, the producer of the message, be waiting for the consumer of the message to finish processing it? So this has some obvious issues. There's some things we could do. Well, first of all, we could make this part of a transaction, right? right? We could do that. Over here, we could make this transactional. That would be a little bit better. I could make this async, I guess, but then we lose the transaction, right? So what I want is some way to have it be transactional and async uh, and to replay events if something goes wrong. So Spring Modulith has this application module listener. This is also a transactional listener. It's at transactional, it's at async, and it is an event listener. So it's all the same things as I just showed you. It's just convenient, okay? And this works really well with a few other features. So here we'll say modulith, republish the, the uh, we're going to initialize the schema, and we're going to say modulith, uh, republish outstanding events on restart. Okay? These things will help us to replay missed events. So let's go ahead and restart the program now. Okay? So now I'm going to do the curl. It should return immediately. Okay? And you go here, and you can see it's, it's calling uh, saved. Where's my? But you can see the inventory controller thing hasn't finished saving, right? So now it finished 10 seconds later. Uh, and so we got the message. But what happens if we cancel? What if we try this again? Let's clear this console here. Go back, replay. It's saving, but now we're going to kill the pro program, right? So it didn't finish. Now what? Well, Spring Modulith has a table that it created for us called event publication. And there you can see there's a completion date of null. Ah, okay. So now we can restart the process, right? And you can see up here, that, where did I put it? Did I miss it? It's on the last slide. Oh, there it is. Yeah, finally. So there you go. So you can see now, it's, it's, it's finished. It's rerunning that. Let's see now. There you go. So it completed it finally. It replayed the missed messages, right? So it's kept track of the events that we published in the system. If we kill the service, it still works. This is more resilient, more production worthy. All right, so now we've got an application that has, it's well designed, it's modular, it's using data oriented programming. We're moving quickly. We've got Docker Compose and DevTools, all this kind of stuff. You know, obviously it's 2024, and the, the search, the ongoing search for regular intelligence has failed. We have not found any. There's no intelligence. And so now we're looking for artificial intelligence. And, uh, you know, Maybe it'll be better. So we have a wonderful project called Spring AI. Spring AI, we announced last August at Spring One. It is a project to support the entire pipeline of working with AI. Remember, when we talk about AI today, we're talking about these various models. These models uh, can be image, convolutional neural networks, uh, that stable diffusion, these kinds of things, or they can be generative text models. Either way, these models are a source of data, but we have to integrate with them. And also, we need to make them aware of our data. They don't know what has changed in our system unless we tell them. So that whole process of taking data, retrieving it from a data source, packaging it up in a way that the model will understand, and then using that to inform the response, that's called retrieval augmented generation. And it's a very key pattern we're working with uh, artificial intelligence and when we, when we work with uh, AI today. So we're going we're gonna to look at a project here called Spring AI. You remember on start.spring.io, I added the open AI support. But we have support for dozens of different models, right? Uh, lots of different models, not just open AI, right? Some are local. You can run them completely offline, open source, on your machine. You don't need any internet at all. Some are hosted. It doesn't matter. You have lots of options. If you want to change the model, just change the starter, okay? You can use Olama and, or, or Hugging Face and, and find all sorts of great things that don't require hosted. But I am using OpenAI. In order to use OpenAI, you, you must specify an OpenAI key, right? The thing, my friends, is I've already done this off screen. I set up an API key as an environment variable and I exported it in my shell before I started my program. Forgive me for not leaking my API credential. Just, just trust me that I've already done it, okay? Um, 
So let's go ahead and create another module here. And we're just going to do a simple example, OK? We're going to create a story time controller. So story controller. Here we go. And I'm just going to create a simple controller that uses the new chat client in Spring AI, OK? Singularity. OK, we're going to inject this. And of course, configuration, class, uh, uh, story, configuration. And we're going to define a bean of type chat client using the new builder DSL in Spring AI. I love the new builder DSL, the new fluid DSL in Spring AI. The, one of the reasons that I love it so much uh, is, well, <laughs> uh, whoa, whoa, is because I helped write it, right? Uh, so I know it's going to be good. Um, so there's that. So here's the chat builder. And so basically, you can set up the chat client. You can have default system uh, prompts. You can have default parameters, default functions, all, all that kind of stuff. But if you're happy with the defaults, just leave it like that. And then you can inject the chat client as I did here. So here, I'm going to create a simple endpoint called story, map, str string, string, story. OK. OK, and we're going to return a map.of story. And my job is to write a prompt to ask the API to give me a reply. So this.singularity.prompt.user, uh, uh, this is the user prompt that we're sending in. And we're going to get the results. So we're going to call it and then get the content as not a chat response, but a string. You can get it cast back to an entity if you want as well. Right? And I'm going to put that reply there. OK, so let's write the reply, or write the, re the prompt here. OK? Uh, dear Singularity. Remember, it's very important to be polite. Have you seen that documentary, Terminator? Very, <laughs> very important. Very important to be polite. Uh, please write a story about the amazing Java and Spring developers in lovely Sofia, Bulgaria. Thank you. No, sorry. Cordially, Josh. Oh, and please do it in the style of famed children's author, Dr. Seuss. Okay? Okay, so let's go ahead and restart that or reset that. Oh, singularity. It doesn't care, but I do. Okay, so curl, HTTP, localhost, 8080, story. Isn't that the endpoint we created? Story. OK, so I'll just wait for that to do its thing. I'll just sit here, drink my coffee. Oh, hey, it's back. OK, in the town of Sofia in Bulgaria so grand, lived, lived some developers oh so in demand. Java and Spring were their tools of the trade, creating software that never did fade. They coded, coded all day and they coded all night. Their skills were a marvel, their future so bright. You get the idea, friends. It can do amazing things, amazing things now, right? The AI, AI has arrived. It's an amazing thing. I like the results. It was easy. It was clean. It was understandable. The type system helped guide my work. I'm a big fan of everything that just happened there. But it did take a little while, didn't it, right? I had to, think of, I had to sit there and drink my coffee while it came back. So that's OK, but this has implications for our system scalability. So as we wrap up, I want to quickly think about ways to make our system more scalable and more production worthy. One thing that you have to understand is that we have a, you know, we're working with a servlet model right now. This is one thread per request. And if you sit there on the thread making a call to the open AI API endpoint, you're going to block those threads. This can limit your scalability in a big way, right? And so we have now Java 21. Java 21 has virtual threads. Basically, the runtime, the Java language runtime, will detect that you're doing a blocking operation, like input stream.read and output stream.write. It'll move the code while you're waiting into RAM and away from the thread. And it'll give that thread to somebody else in the system that can use it. If you're just going to sit there waiting, then you shouldn't be on the thread, right? You're wasting time on the thread. So the runtime will automatically move you off of the thread. And you can enable that in Spring Boot like this. Spring threads virtual enabled equals true. So my friends, what I recommend you do is you go to your management. You go to the management and you say, look, boss, I have a big idea. I'm going to save us 
like a lot of money on infrastructure. We're going to be able to scale down and handle the same load, but it's going to take me at least two weeks, and I must not be disturbed. And then you go on vacation. And then you tell them, I want that money that we save as an incentive, as a bonus. Put it in my paycheck to make it so that I ha if I'm working those long nights and long days, I will feel worth my time, okay? And then you just do this property, upgrade to Java 21, and go on vacation. Good deal, right? Much better scalability. Thank you, Java. And by the way, this is one, enjoy this, enjoy this. These virtual threads, this is one of the very few times in last few decades where I can say that Java is better than the other languages, <laughs> right? JavaScript, no, Java, better. Python, no, Java, better, right? This is actually better. It's not just the same, it's better than the equivalent. Other languages have something called async await, right? <laughs> yeah, you can see my, <laughs> right? my friend uh, reminds me that async await can be sung to the tune of A sink await, a sink await, a sink await, a sink await in the tangle of spaghetti code. I don't know, whatever. Okay, um, so my point is virtual threads are awesome and it's easy to add, so do that, okay? Much better scalability and it's really, it's just there. Java 21, it's free, just upgrade. You have no reason to be using anything less than Java 21. Okay, that's part one. Part two is I want to make my application as fast and scalable as possible. And friends, here it's worth understanding that Java is already really, really, really efficient and scalable. There's this wonderful blog. Have you seen this blog? This is from 2018, before the COVID pandemic or BC. And <laughs> this, this blog asks the question, which programming languages use the least electricity? And if you look at the results, some of them are not surprising but some of them are. So let's open this in a new tab, okay? So for normalized global results for energy, time, and memory, you can see that C is the most energy efficient for machines, not people. Machines, very important to be clear on this. Very important. Rust, okay, 1.03, zero cost abstractions, doing quite well, good job. C++, <laughs> Disgusting. Disgusting. <laughs> Moving on. We have Ada, who cares? And then we have Java. And Java is 1.98. Almost two. Almost two, okay? So simple math. One, two, okay? We can say that Java is twice as inefficient as C, as a C okay? So far, so good. Moving on down the list. You've got some other entries that are pretty amazing here. You've got Swift, iPhone, iPad, Mac OS. You've got C Sharp. You've got Go, Away. You've got, you've got these two languages. I don't understand how JavaScript is 4.45 and then TypeScript is 21. <laughs> Makes no sense. I thought one was related to the other. And then there's all these, dis there's these two disgusting languages. The less said about which, the better. Okay, and then we go down here, and then friends, you've got JRuby and Ruby. JRuby is Ruby in Java. Ruby is Ruby in C. And yet, JRuby is almost a third more energy efficient than Ruby. That's because the JVM is awesome software. It really is awesome software. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. It's always been amazing, and it's getting better. And then, and then, and then we have Python. <laughs> and this makes me so sad because I love Python. I have been using Python since the 1990s, Bill Clinton was the president in my country when I learned Python. But this number is unacceptable. 75.8. Let's do some simple math, okay? Let's just say 76. 
So what is 76 divided by 2? I'm not very good at math. You know who is? Freaking Python. So 76 divided by 2 is 38. You know what that means? That means that if you take a program that's written in Java and you run it and it uses electricity and that electricity you, to create the energy, you create a little bit of carbon and that carbon goes into the atmosphere and it warms the temperature of the planet by a little bit and then one tree dies. Okay, sad, very sad. The same program in Python kills 38 trees. That's a forest. That's worse than Bitcoin. We, it's really a problem here, friends. Like, I don't know how to fix it, but we do need to fix it. Anyway, Java's awesome, okay? I, I think it's amazing, and it's also really fast. How many of you have seen the 1BRC dev challenge, right? This was a challenge that our friend Gunnar Morling, Morling uh, announced back in December, and he asked people to parse one billion rows of weather station telemetry data. And the results, you know, hundreds of people from all around the community submitted their answers. You cannot use frameworks, you cannot use special, uh, you know, libraries. It has to be in the JDK, and then you can compile it, and that's it, right? Um, and so there's a lot of different responses here, and you can see the results. Remember, it's, a, it's 13 gigabytes of data, right? A billion rows of text. And so the results are amazing, but the fastest results, 1.5 seconds. That means you hit enter, the, then the program is done, and it prints out the statistics, right? 1.5, just one, done. 13 gigabytes of data. And then it can do it in 1.5. And in fact, there's a lot of them that take 1.5, 1.6, 1.8, 1.9. It's not hard to get incredibly good performance in Java. Really, really good. A lot of these, however, use GraalVM. GraalVM is an open JDK distribution that provides extra utilities that support native compilation. And Spring supports that as well. So I am going to go ahead and do that here. I'll create a native image. Okay. Skip test P native native compile. I'm skipping the test because <laughs> I, I didn't write any. It's very awkward. Okay. So we're, we're going to let that run. It's going to do its thing. This, the problem with these native images, my friends, is that they just take a long time. They take several seconds or more on your machine because they're doing very sophisticated tree shaking, basically. They're looking at your code and they're finding the stuff that you're not using and they're going to throw it away, right? This, this, this algorithm takes a long time, but the results are awesome. The results are very good, but it does take a long time. And the problem is I get bored very easily, right? I, I sit there and I start checking my phone, checking Twitter and Slack and Facebook and whatever, uh, or X and Meta, they keep changing it. Like, uh, I, I get very bored very easily. Sometimes I'll stare at the wall or look out the window. Hi. Uh, uh, sometimes I'll talk to this guy. I mean, it just takes a long time, right? And eventually, I start to hear music in my head. Do you ever listen to music when you're coding? Or sometimes I don't even, sometimes if I'm bored, even if the music's not playing, I hear the music, right? And I get really bored with this. It just takes forever. And so eventually I start to hear elevator music in my head, you know? And I, I wondered, wouldn't it be great if everybody could hear elevator music? So I went to Oracle and I said, Oracle, please play elevator music during the native image compilation process, right? And I got some great responses. I says, I already hear elevator music in my head when I do these long compilations. I'd just like everybody else to hear it too. Thank you in advance and I appreciate your amazing work, right? And I do, I really do, I appreciate their work. They're awesome. And I got some great responses. This one is from our friend over at Red Hat. It's Andrew Din. Andrew Din is a distinguished engineer, a Red Hat Java team, Open JDK project reviewer, Byteman project lead, and a Growl developer. So obviously, this was a good use of his time. And what he suggested was, to use some music from the 1990s GoldenEye video game, Nintendo 64 video game. So this is the soundtrack for the video game for the movie from James Bond in the 1990s, okay? And it's pretty good. I cannot play it for you, I think, for copyright reasons, but it's pretty good. I like that. Somebody else said, I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native image, really helped me to reduce development time. Yeah, like a microwave. Ding! 
code's done. That's how it should be. That's a really smart idea. I like this. And then we get this response from my friend, Dr. Fabio Niepaus, another one of my favorite doctors. He's a doctor on the Gravium team at Oracle Labs. He's a PhD. And he says, thank you for your feature request, Josh. The problem with playing the music is that it's just fixing the symptoms and we've been and are still working on the cause, making Gravium native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. Go on. I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. So that's what this is. So you, you run the compiler. It uses native image dash dash Josh Long mode right there. And then you compile and it says music brought to you by Josh Long. That's me. I'm Josh Long. And then you're still listening. You're still bored. You're wondering where the music is from and you're still waiting for the code. So now you have something to look at, right? And I, I'm sure this will get merged into the compiler soon. I don't know when, but soon. Anyway, what were we doing? Oh, right, uh, our program. Is it finished? Let's see. Oh, <laughs> it, that's very embarrassing. It finished several minutes ago. Okay, so here we go, target. I'm gonna start the program, right? Service. Oh, port is already in use. Let me stop it over here. Okay, boom, there we go. There's a program, a tenth of a second, right? Less than, less than you, you know, it's faster than the one BRC results. And then more valuably, I take this, PS minus O, RSS, get that, divide this by a thousand, right? Because it's uh, in megabytes, and these are in kilobytes by default. So it's just, it's 128, 120 megabytes for a program that starts up in, you know, tenth, uh, one, one uh, tenth of a second uh, that takes 120 something megabytes of RAM that has AI, virtual threads, scalability, nicely clean, modular code base, uh, and, uh, and more. And it's production worthy. My friends, there's never been a better time to be a Java and Spring developer. I hope I've persuaded you of this. I have a couple of questions. First of all, who learned something new? All right, good. Who had fun? All right, good. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Awesome. Yay. Thank you. Thank you so much. One more photo. Here we go. Okay, Josh, the taxi is waiting for you. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you. <laughs>